welcome to the Hockey IQ podcast with my guest here, Jared Lavender, which was a phenomenal episode. We have uh, Dan Ducart. I'm Greg Rebeck. Um, really enjoyed this episode. I mean, Jared is just a great guy. Uh, I think the last story he told was about donating his hair that he grew out for seven years, uh, raising money for charity, things like that. So I think uh, that's just a starting point. What about you, Dan? What did you uh, see or get out of this episode? I really enjoyed chatting with Jared. I'd never met the guy before, but real quality character. Um, I, I just really appreciate his, you know, the way he talked about how he goes about coaching. It's very holistic. He, you know, he doesn't just focus on uh, skill development or anything like that. It's, it's really like a holistic approach to, you know, you're developing human beings. And uh, I think that's something that's maybe, you know, maybe under appreciated. And he, had several, you know, stories about the way he makes an impact in kids' lives. So I thought that was really inspiring. I agree. I, I think it was wonderful how he, he basically talked about how he goes about letting players find that platform and not wanting to yell from the bench and making sure that it's just a good rapport between them so that they can grow, develop, have that creativity um, just as people. So I think that was the big takeaway for me on this episode was creating such – great people that they're going to become better hockey players because of it. And I think it's underlooked by maybe parents and players that are going through that process is if you get better and more mature and grow and learn off the ice, that it directly impacts um, what you do on the ice and whether that be hockey IQ skills or just being a, a better teammate, um, it all makes a difference. Absolutely. All right. Without further ado, here's our episode with Jared Lavender. Welcome Jared. This is called the Hockey IQ Podcast. We're going to talk everything Hockey IQ, training, and more. Uh, today we have Jared Lavender. He is a local coach here up in Cleveland. Uh, personally, I've benefited from his coaching, and I've got a few of his players on my high school team. They were a pleasure, well-prepared. So I, I know Jared does a really nice job, always has the kids moving. So uh, really excited to have you on, Jared. Appreciate having uh, being here. Greg and uh, yeah, hopefully we can talk about some good stuff. And <laughs> I always like learning stuff too, so um, that's that's my biggest goal. But uh, I'll try to give some of my knowledge that I've learned yeah. in the last few years. Absolutely, it'll be a conversation. And my co-host Dan Ducart is uh, on the call as well. So how are we doing? He's a Jens? wicked smart guy. He's a Belfry guy, so he he's been around a few NHL players. How's Seen going, some things. Dan? So first questions here. I'm kind of interested to hear about your coaching journey. I know you had a great, illustrious playing career, um, went to a lot of places, came from Heights High School. So I'm more, uh, I guess, worried about your, your coaching. What uh, has molded <laughs> you as a coach? How have you come to be a coach at the Jacks, and, and why have you kind of chosen the path that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first and foremost, I'll start off by saying that I actually didn't think that I would ever become a coach um, because through and through, I'm a, definitely a hockey player. Um, so I was a little worried about that and hesitant when I first took uh, my first coaching job, um, but come, came to find out that I loved it. Um, so yeah, but I first started off coaching at Cleveland Heights uh, in their youth program. Uh, so it was a really good group of kids that I started off with, great families um, that I was working with. So that made it very, very easy to kind of transition in, into that. Uh, one of the most difficult things with that was uh, the level of play. We had some players that were very, very talented and some players that had just started to learn how to play uh, a year or two prior to uh, joining my team. So, um, but yeah, that was Cleveland Heights. Uh, that was Bantam hockey. <clears throat> um, and I coached that team for two years. And then after that, uh, that's when I was talking with uh, Bob Jacobson, and he got me to switch over to uh, coaching travel hockey, and uh, the rest was history. So I coached uh, travel hockey um, basically three years, uh, 05 team. Two of them were with the Cleveland Junior Lumberjacks organization. Uh, one year we went independent, um, and uh, uh, that was just for a happenstance. Um, just kind of worked out that way, but it worked out well. Had the same group of kids. Um, we had a good season. And then those kids, once they went off to high school, uh, joined the Jacks again to coach their 08 team. And uh, that's who I coached last year. So they're first year Pee Wees. Um, and I plan on staying with them for three years as well. So this will be my second year with the uh, Cleveland Junior Lumberjacks 08 team. So you, you mentioned now that you, you coached the uh, Bantam and now Pee Wee. 
do you uh you know prefer that age group for one reason or another or preferences there like what what makes you uh what makes that tick yeah, so that, that age group, I think it's a perfect age group where kids are, um, you know, those, those young players are really starting to grasp concepts, and they're, that's when you're able to actually implement it and um, have them start working on stuff. So you see a lot of growth. One, the kids are starting to, you know, they'll grow, you know, a few inches in a, a few months sometimes. Um, so, like, I have some kids I didn't even recognize, and we just did a, a couple skates this weekend. I didn't recognize them because they grew so tall and, you know, starting – starting to kind of fill out too. Um, but this is really the age where you can really help to mold them and get them into good habits that uh, hopefully they will keep for you know the remainder of their career and they go a long way. So it's really that age group where they're still willing to listen to you and they're really just starting to develop. Yeah, that's that awesome. That is the truest thing I've ever heard. This age group <laughs> where they're still willing to listen to you. I've got the high school kids. Um, I know how that goes sometimes. You can give them the perfect argument, absolutely nothing that they can say to differ it, and they just don't want to listen to you that day. So yeah. it doesn't matter. So I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> big time, big time. Um, why, do you, why do you want to stay with them? I, I think that's kind of an interesting concept. I feel like uh, usually like this guy does U18s, this guy does U16s, this guy does U14s because they know the age groups. Mm -hmm. um it's so the reason why you do that a benefit that you've seen um and just maybe some nuances to that yeah for me um i think it's beneficial to stay with those for the majority of those players for an, an extended period of time if you're just with them for one season um you know you can give them a lot of information you can work with them a lot but uh, I feel like you can really help to mold those kids when you have them year after year. And, um, and sometimes with certain kids, it, it takes longer for them to understand a concept or understand something you're trying to coach. Or, or maybe I have to learn it a different way to coach it to them a different way. Um, so I, I, that's the part that I enjoy. I feel like sometimes uh, one season just isn't long enough to work with the player. Um, and so I really enjoy having, for the most part, uh, those same players year after year to work with and really help uh, mold them and get them going. I like that concept, but uh, you said something very interesting that I think is kind of underrated in coaching. Uh, having to learn it a different way, so you have to teach it a different way. So, yeah. uh, I mean, what you got some examples that you can uh, help the listeners out here with. So I think that is, that is something that is a little more advanced than what basic coaching is or what people think about when they talk about coaching. There's been plenty of scenarios where I've had to kind of teach it. I would say one of the main ones that I can remember is actually with uh, one of the players that is actually curr currently playing on your team. And um, we, had, we had a great – he's a great kid, hard, super hard worker, um, and just getting him to kind of refocus his energy. Um, and uh, so, you know, I talked with him a bunch. I was trying to get through to him. And he would just always get to the point where he just kind of shut down, would not, you know, listen, would not work, um, and, and would just kind of shut down. Be, be, and not because he was, like, just, you know, being a brat. It was just because he was just so frustrated with what was going on in the game. Um, and so in that scenario, actually, what helped me was my assistant coach at the time, David Keller. He um, was able to talk and connect with that player in a, a completely different way than I could. So it, where 90% of the time that player may connect with me and, and I can explain stuff, he'll go out there and do it. Um, certain situations he would get so flustered where David would take a different approach with it and he would, um, and, and he would make a breakthrough, get him to open up, talk about that, and then get him back focused in, in the game. So uh, for that, that, and that was one of the times where I realized different players you have to approach differently. So there's a lot of players where – you just kind of have to get a read on them and you may see that it, the, the minute that they think that they're that they're going to get yelled at even if you don't yell at them the minute that they think they're going to get yelled at they completely shut down and so when they get back to the bench that's when you have to do the exact opposite you have to build them back up and say hey that was a great play you know you keep working hard out there and then when it, once it's a good time then you can go back and kind of talk with them so i mean there's just so many different scenarios uh, when coaching that uh, and each player is different and that's how you kind of have to approach it it's, it can be very time consuming and can be very difficult but each player is different and you have to try to in order to get the best the most potential out of them you have to approach them all differently 
hopefully that was uh, <laughs> explained that as well as I could. <laughs> oh, that's great. And I'm pretty sure I know exactly which kid that you're talking about as well. Yeah. We, yeah. we won't name names, but uh, no, he's, he's a good kid. And yeah. Now he's a, a treat to work with, but I could see yeah. in his younger days how that could have been a thing. Mm -hmm. Big time, yeah. big time. Yeah, and he, he definitely, he went from one of our players, you know, where he could be, uh, he could definitely be one of the top players, but um, at, he, he had a, a turnaround that third year, and that's what it took. It took to that third season. We had a completely different turnaround, and his mindset was just perfect every single time, whether it was practice, whether it was games. You know, he just wanted to go out there and work hard. I mean, he could be completely exhausted, just get off a shift, and we needed him to go kill a penalty, and we'd say, hey, you know, are you ready to go? And he'd be like, no. And then he'd say, yeah, I can go. You know, put me out there. And, and that, that's what all we wanted, and that's what all we, you know, we asked of him. And he went out there and did that every time. So definitely appreciated that. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Um, I guess I'm curious on how that works. And it kind of builds off the story you just told. Uh, it took until the third year for that kid to really take that step. Um, how does that kind of maybe interweave itself into your thoughts and kind of what those are as well um, on player development and your philosophy on, on getting your players developed. Because clearly you're playing the long game if you're thinking not just one, two, but three plus years ahead. Right. Yeah, so there's a couple different scenarios um, as far as uh, my philosophy on coaching and uh, kind of player development. I think first and foremost, you, you have to have the basics. Um, you know, so there's, there's always a lot of skill work that we work on. Um, and uh, I, I think that's first and foremost. You have to have the basic skating skills, you know, basic skills, and you have to always want to work on it and always get better. You know, uh, with a lot of the um, O5s that I coached initially, you know, so, so many of them, you know, they see the highlights and they just want to, you know, work on picking corners and, you know, doing certain uh, dangles and, and this and that. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a very, very small portion of the game where, um, and, you know, lots of times it's, the uh, higher end top caliber players that are doing that type of stuff where uh, not every player can do that or be that. So, uh, but there's a lot more to the game and uh, even some of the top or actually all the top end, you know, players, they still work on their edge work, you know? So when it comes to basics like that, um, I, I think that's where, that's where you have to build a strong foundation. Um, so, uh, you know, always working on those basic skills is a, a great thing. Um, and, and then after that, what I look to do is uh, a lot of repetitive um, drills. Uh, so just so it kind of gets hammered into their, so they don't even have to think about it, you know? So it's just um, constant um, working on different skills, different si situations. Um, and a lot of my drills I like to do, I like to have them um, uh, game-like situations. So that way they don't have to, uh, they're not even thinking about it and, they're not even realizing at the time, but they're working on something that would uh, potentially come up in a game. Um, but uh, I think the main thing and the most important thing, and this is something that I took away from coaching and coaches that I had, and luckily I had a lot of great coaches um, all the way up from youth hockey to uh, juniors to college and pro. Um, you know, a lot of the coaches took the um, thought process that, if you kind of make a better person, you'll make a better player. Um, and so you really try to hammer home, like you don't want players that are gonna, you know, cheat, you know, cut corners. Um, and you don't wanna teach or coach that. So, you know, cause at the end of the day, if you cheat and cut corners, it'll only work out for you so long. And then um, eventually it'll come back to bite you or your team. So, uh, and, and, I'm a firm believer um, because I think it, it benefited myself and uh, helped me to get uh, where I got is that, um, you know, hard work is going to outweigh someone that has talent but doesn't want to work hard. And that's something that we can always control. You can't control if you are the best stick handler out there um, or the best shot, but you can control working hard and you can definitely outwork other players. So those are just a couple, you know, the basic things that, um, that I really focus on. You know, obviously basics, basic skills, whether it's skating, shooting, stick handling, um, and then, you know, just working hard, being, you know, properly conditioned and ready to go. Um, and, then, uh, and then just really focusing on the players as, as a person, not just a hockey player, and how they can 
use the knowledge and skills that they learn playing hockey in a sport like that, whether it's teamwork, whether, you know, it's the effort that they put in. And uh, they could translate that to school, you know, eventually to, uh, to work, um, you know, or anything else. So uh, with my 05s, um, the second and third year, I actually did a lot of, uh, did a lot of goal planning with them. And so I didn't make it mandatory, but I, you know, made it, uh, made it something that they could do. And a majority of the team would do that. And we would work on uh, setting goals and then really focusing and narrowing in on those goals and then how to achieve them. Um, so that, that was uh, really good stuff. And I plan on doing that with my 08s as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of where I go with it. Um, and as far as trying to develop like a, a, a good player, um, I think with my coaching style that I really uh, try to set the tone early and um, in a, especially at a young age, it, what plays a factor can also be the family. Um, and like I said, I, I've been very, very uh, kind of thankful and lucky that for the most part, I've had really, really great families um, and they're super supportive. And if they have any questions, they come up and ask me that they're, you know, they're not super aggressive about, um, you know, if they have an issue or, or if they think that maybe I did something wrong or that their kid was getting uh, unfair treatment, um, you know, they would come up and talk with me. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I always try to talk about and address any potential issues early on in the season so that we don't run into any issues later on. And if we do, I can always refer back to that, that meeting. Um, so I think definitely the family plays a huge role in that um, because if the family's not really really listening or if the, you know, the, the mom or dad wants to coach the, the, their player and say, don't listen to your coach, they're not going to fit in. And it becomes evident as the season goes on. And the, luck, the, um, the good thing about that is that, they, uh, that that player and that family, I usually don't have to even cut them because they don't come back and try out. And so it just makes our, um, just makes our team that much tighter and that much better. And, uh, you know, just minimizes the issues that we have, you know, so there's not a lot of in-house fighting and not a lot of uh, arguments and stuff like that. So that makes for a better environment for everybody. Sounds like Absolutely. the uh, the next team you want to coach is an orphanage. <laughs> you know what? Actually, uh, this summer coaching uh, some summer hockey games and with everything going on in the world, uh, the sometimes the rinks weren't allowing parents in the stands. And that was some of the best hockey that I saw the uh, kids play. Um, and so I, I think it has some benefits. Obviously, parents want to see their kids play, but um, it was just too funny to see the kids out there having a great time. None of them were looking to the stands to see, you know, if their parents were like, oh, you did a good job, or you should do this, or you should do that. You know, they were just playing, playing the game and having a great time. So that was cool to see. That's awesome. So you touched a lot on, you know, skill development and then building uh, culture. I think both of those are hugely important and can't be overstated. Uh, I totally agree with everything you said. I'm mm -hmm. curious um, how you go about developing hockey IQ. You know, that is a great question. And there's certain things that I think about all the time. And uh, one of them is hockey IQ and creativity, honestly. I think uh, with some of these, or a lot of these younger players, and I think they kind of go hand in hand, because um, I think a lot of hockey players with a high IQ are very, very creative. And, you know, they don't even think about necessarily what they're gonna do. They just have all those utensils in their bag, and then they pull it out at the right time when they need to. Um, but uh, coaching hockey IQ is very, very difficult. Um, and I kind of think back to, you know, how did I learn the game? Um, and I really learned the game by observation. So I recommend, um, and, and that's how I learned too a lot about coaching, you know, whether I'm at a rink, you know, away in New York, I learn a lot about just watching uh, someone else's practice, um, you know, watching what other coaches do or talking with other coaches and bouncing ideas off of them. Um, but same thing, uh, you know, when I was playing, I learned a lot about watching, whether I was younger, watching high school, uh, college, juniors, um, pro. And so that's one of the things that I recommend. And I kind of, I'll send emails uh, to our team with clips of uh, certain plays or certain parts to kind of help kids to start hopefully trying to recognize that. Now, obviously, whether or not they, they uh, watch those clips and how often they watch them, who knows. 
But I think, honestly, that's one of the biggest – or one of the easiest ways for some players to start kind of building up that hockey IQ is really focusing – and that's what I try to tell them. Focus in on just one player and watch that player for, you know, a whole game and see what they do really well, what you like that they do. And that's kind of what I would do when I was younger. I would pick and choose – um, one player here or there, watch them and see, and as you know, oh, they did that really great. I want to try that. And then go out there and try it. Um, now, I think one of the biggest issues is that a lot of players, you know, they start watching those clips and then they just see highlights and they're like, okay, I want to try to do that. And that doesn't necessarily help their hockey IQ. Um, but yeah, one hockey IQ, I think it's one of the very, it's a very difficult thing to kind of coach a player. Um, it's something that I think they have to kind of be willing it to work on. I totally agree with that. And, you know, so I coach Bantam also. And okay. it's funny because, like, you will send – we do the same thing, right? So we'll send players um, highlights or whatever clips on YouTube. And, first of all, whether or not they watch it, like you said, that's, that's its own, you know, issue right there. But even if they do, I feel like I'm always trying to fight this uphill battle to even just get them to watch games while they're at home. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, when I was a kid – if I had any opportunity to watch a hockey game, it was a no brainer. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't yeah. know if it's like a generational thing or if it's just like competing screens or, or what it is, but yeah, I, it is an uphill battle just to get kids to watch hockey, which I can't relate to. And yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I, mean, I actually saw the most amazing might I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we actually, I saw him, he's at a squirt trout here in Giaga. He was on a breakaway and he tried to go between the legs, pick it up, off the ice and do that little spinorama move. Like the uh, fact that he's trying it means he's probably done it one or one or two times. And I asked him like, Oh, how, where'd you pick this up? And he's like, Oh yeah, I watch YouTube highlights. I'm like, great. Uphill battle at Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's kind of like where we are with, uh, you know, social media. Cause if you think about it, I mean, you know, a lot of these uh, video um, apps, you know, they last what, you know, maybe 10, 15, 30 seconds. And, uh, you know, so there a lot of these kids are growing up used to just watching these short clips and seeing these short. And so that's what they kind of pick up on. And, and that's what they see. And that's that's what all they want to you know, they have an attention span just to watch that. And then they want to move on. Exactly. It's exactly why I started my uh, clip of the day series when I yeah. got on Twitter. Decided that uh, maybe my players need to focus on something that's not just getting a, a dangle through someone's legs and then roofing the puck. Maybe we should look at the details that go into that. So totally understand that and try to keep it short because you know they're not going to watch anything more than a minute minute and a half tops what can coaches do a better job of um i, I mean i think we kind of uh, touched on it um i think coaches can do a better job of teaching to all players um on their team and you know there's there's some coaches whether it's you know and i i don't want to even say it's older school coaches because i know some some coaches that I had back when, you know, I was younger that would, you know, try to work towards everybody's strengths and, and really try to build up players. But um, I, I think, you know, just being able to coach um, all types of players uh, and, and even more so, I, I think you're going to find it because, like, for example, my team, I have uh, two, two young females on the team. And so I can't treat them the same way that I would treat, you know, one of the, uh, one of the boys on my team. Um, you know, I have to have a little bit of a different approach. And even between those, those two girls, I can treat one, you know, be a little tougher on one and the other one, you know, I have to really make sure that I'm, you know, super supportive and just building her up. And uh, same thing with, uh, with the boys. Uh, you know, one I may not be able to say anything about, um, and, the, you know, the other one I can be tough on and say, hey, pick it up, you know, we need to go. So I think that's one of the biggest things that coaches uh, really need to work on. I think um, always learning, uh, you know, that's it, one of the things that uh, being around different players at different skill levels, uh, what, what I see more times than not from those higher end coaches and higher end uh, players is that, uh, you know, they're always learning. It doesn't matter who. It could be someone that just started skating uh, but has watched hockey their whole life. They still feel like they can learn something from that, that person, you know. Um, and even in, it now, especially with technology, you can just hop on and start looking through articles, start looking at YouTube videos, and you can see all different types of philo philosophies and different types of, um, uh, you know, plays and, and systems to run. 
and even something that Greg uh, tweeted out the other day made me rethink how I want to uh, have, you know, offense's own face off and who I want attacking where. So, um, you know, I think that's just a constant with hockey. You know, there, there's tons of different ways to do it. Um, and you got to kind of keep trying stuff until, uh, until something works. And it, every team's going to be a little different. You know, something that works for one team may not work for another team that you're coaching. So um, those are the two biggest things. You know, you got to make sure that you're coaching to those players and, and then always learn. That's, that's amazing. And what you just said is exactly what I try to do is ask myself questions. And then, like, am I actually thinking about this? I feel like there's so many things that you pick up through coaching and everyone does them because they've done it for a million years, but they don't actually actually ask themselves, why are we doing this? And then trying to figure out and having that little self start to why are we doing it this way? And then doing the research or I've never thought of this before. I don't really have a thought on it. Do the research, go out there and come up with something. Uh, I also so something that, big. But, you know, I also think that like today's kids, like they want to know, you know what I mean? Where maybe when we were growing up and playing, it would have been different where like coach says something, so you do it. And that's, that's that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can get away with that anymore. And that's, you know, that's a good thing. So I think it, it forces coaches to really, you know, be introspective about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and then being able to communicate that. Yeah. And actually, that's a great point. I think, uh, actually, I think with my team, they don't ask enough, like, why, you know, why are we doing this? Or how do we get to this point? Um, and so sometimes I, I, I've been trying to do a better job of getting in the habit of explaining, you know, why we're doing this or, or sometimes I'll have a drill set up and we'll do the drill, you know, for five minutes and then I'll bring everybody in and, and say, okay, you know, does anybody see where we could potentially do this or why, why we're doing this drill? Because in a game scenario, you know, we could do this. So, but uh, yeah, it's a, that's a great point. That, yeah, that's was, hilarious. You said that I was doing a practice on Tuesday um, and I was going up to this group and I'm like, okay, you know me guys, you've been around me for a full year now. Why are we doing this drill? And like seeing what they remember and what are they actually focusing on when they're doing the drill? I'm like, there's a reason why we're doing this. What is it? And then like trying to just watch them fumble over like, oh, what, what, why are we doing this? Yeah. One, it's entertaining. Two, I think it actually starts to get them exactly what you said, trying to ask those questions, trying to understand it. Um, so I'm a big believer in empowering the players. Like, at the end of the day, I'm not on the ice making those passes. Like, I want to be on the bench, not yelling, shoot, pass, far side, whatever that may be, because I want yeah. them to know it all, have all those questions, and start answering them for themselves. So. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I, I think that's the best way to go about it and making sure that it's it's not about us. It's all about the players and mm -hmm. giving the responsibility. And I, I call it uh, pushing the responsibility off. Like, I yeah. by the end of the season, should be doing very little. You guys should be doing most of it. Um, and then continuing to raise that bar each year. Yeah, and that's one of the things I think, uh, uh, you know, players don't get enough credit, especially young players. Uh, where I find that um, whether it's coaches or parents or whatever, you know, they're like, oh, you know, they, they can't do that, you know, or they can't compete with that team. They're not that good. And it's like, well, you know, because I actually on purpose will throw in every once in a while, we'll throw in a really, really difficult drill, you know, like a drill that I did in uh, college or pros that even at that level, you know, we're going full speed, but even at that level, you know, it, it was difficult for us to, to uh, complete. So I'll throw in a drill every once in a while just to say, and then I'll call them all in and say, hey, just so you guys know, you guys were supposed to fail miserably at that. And you actually did a really good job. You know, I surprised myself. I thought it was going to last for about three minutes and you guys weren't going to complete two passes and get a shot on that. But you guys actually did it. It was flowing nicely. Everything was running well. And, you know, so don't, don't, uh, you know, don't hold yourself back or don't think down on yourself. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can really do, do something. And, I think that's one of the biggest things because uh, when I was growing up, and, and that's what, what I always try to relate to, when I was growing up, um, you know, there were a lot of coaches that believed in me, but I think, you know, what really uh, kind of set, set myself apart for, for me personally, what I wanted to do with hockey was when I had some coaches that didn't think I, ha I had the potential to go to the next level or, or play at a certain level. And then, um, whether I was stubborn or dumb, um, you know, I wanted to say, hey, hey, let me try and see, you know, what's the worst that can happen if I try my best and I see what happens, you know, so 
that's kind of the biggest thing with young players is trying to get them to believe in themselves and then just try your hardest and don't be afraid about making mistakes. You know, if you're trying your hardest and you make a mistake, I'm not going to be upset with you about that. Um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that you're trying your best and then we'll make up for it or we have other things in place. Or if you do make a mistake, we have a goalie in net. You know, we have other defenders and other players out there on the ice that can help out. And, and even if they score, you know, there's still a lot more time left in the game. We can go back out there and try to score some goals. But um, that's the biggest thing is, and kind of like you said, hold the players accountable, but um, make sure that you believe in them, that they know that you believe in them and try to get them to believe in themselves. I think that's a huge part of it. And taking that one step further, and this is something I, I think you both can agree on, you almost have to give the players permission to succeed or take the risk. Like they're almost like for whatever reason, they've had this thing where I need to ask mom and dad yes or no before I can actually do it. And it's like, it's okay. You can try it. You can succeed. You are allowed to do these things. Like give them that permission to explore that space and grow into themselves. Yeah. And I think that has a little bit to do with um, kind of the creativity. Uh, and that's been one of the hard things for myself coaching is um, you know trying to get players to be more creative, uh, and, and so they kind of hold back and they're they're hesitant to um, try to do that. So uh, you know I try to incorporate drills where all right here's the main idea of the drill. Other than that, you guys have to create everything else or you have to do whatever. Um, and uh, <laughs> the thing that I <laughs> I don't like to see is when we're doing a drill and I'm like all right here's three different options that you can do, um, and then I'll demonstrate one of them and then you know every uh, line will go and then every single line does the same thing that I just did. Oh, I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, and I'm like, okay, let's make sure that we're trying in a couple other scenarios here. Here's a scenario two, here's scenario three again, just in case you forgot. So sometimes I think it's just, they're paying attention and, and or they just remember the first one that you talked about or the last one that you talked about. And then that's what all they focus on and work on and do. Yeah, I'm big on that, having those parameters and then just letting them figure it out. And then I, I get players coming up to me like, are we allowed to do this? I'm like, I didn't say you couldn't. Right. Let's go for it. Like, right. if, you, if you can think of the creativity, just go for it. I'm giving you what you can't do or something that destroys the drill. But other than that, like, have at it, guys. Have that yeah. creativity. And I think that's perfect. Creating the parameters, letting the guys explore uh, the space. That's, that's freaking huge. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's super big into just developing that awareness and developing that person. Like you said, it, it's not just about hockey. It's how do we make hockey a transferable vehicle for life skills? That's, right. that's always the big question for me. Yeah. Uh, we do a little bit at Akron with that. We call it our life you program where we actually have like a whole uh, program on off ice stuff that you won't get in school and those types of things. So I think that's pretty cool, but um, getting into more on coaching and, and how you coach, what is maybe some of the greatest things that you've done or some big epiphanies you've had as a coach um, for your teams or for yourself that's created that? So what, what's the greatest thing you've done as a coach for, your, for yourself? Oh, gosh. Uh, in my short um, coaching career, uh, I mean – I don't, I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of different things, um, you know, because I could even say from, uh, uh, from you know, when I, early on coaching at Cleveland Heights, um, helping kids to, you know, make the varsity team at high school. Um, could, that's something that's great. You know, the kids are super excited about that, happy. Um, and then even some of those kids, because of their, their – because they're able to play, you know, it may have kind of helped them to get into a college that they liked and or make a, a club team, you know, here or there. Um, so that, that's at that level uh, with some of the, like the travel hockey. Um, I mean, honestly, just seeing kids grow uh, and helping them out and, and grow as a player. I mean, that's some of the, the best things that I've seen. And not only that, but then also seeing kids uh, want to help out other players. So, I also do a program, or I, I did a program at Cleveland Heights, um, learn to play hockey and tot hockey. And, uh, you know, just talked a lot with the kids about working on skill and, you know, told them one of the things that can really help you out to kind of figure out what you're doing with your own body is teaching other players. And uh, I had a ton of the 05s that would um, always come out and help me out with those little kids. 
Uh, and I think that's terrific. And, and a lot of the, the times the, the players just wanted to come out and do it on their own. You know, I didn't have to ask anybody. I didn't have to tell anybody. They're just like, hey, can I come this Monday? And, and then for a little bit, I had to tell them, okay, we have to sit, uh, create a sign up because we had too many kids out on the ice more than we had uh, for the uh, tot hockey. So um, I think seeing something like that is terrific because that just shows how much they love the game. And whenever I think about hockey, I just think about how much I love playing it. Um, and how much I do love playing it and being a part of it. And I just want them to have that same love that I've felt for it for however many years, you know, for 30-some uh, years that I've been playing now. But um, uh, and, and that's – I think that's kind of the beauty of the game and the thing that I love is that I just want them to grow that love for the sport. And then hopefully when they're in my situation too, then now they're wanting to give back. I don't have any kids on any of the teams that I've coached. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to give back to the community. I want ho uh, hockey here in Cleveland to be as, uh, as good as it can be and kids to learn how to play the game um, the right way. But other, other than that, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we won a couple tournament, small tournaments here or there. Nothing super impressive about that. Um, all the other kids they, that I've that, uh, been coaching for travel hockey, not, none of them are at uh, college age yet, but soon. So I think that'll be great if I could help get some kids into uh, college um, and, uh, and pros. I think that, that would be a, a huge milestone. I'd be pretty happy about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, the, the biggest thing is just seeing the kids grow and, uh, and grow the love of the game. And that's what it's really all about, growing the love of the game. I mean, if, you're, if your players are leaving you with more passion for playing and being around it and having a great team experience, I, I think that's, that's a win, just having more love when they leave you than when they started with you. So uh, I think Sammy Martin would be one kid that uh, loves the game more than maybe I do even. <laughs> He's nothing but hockey, hockey, hockey. We, we were getting schlacked by basically a uh, – team that was way better and yeah other kids are like oh i just want this game to be over and sam's like why we're getting <laughs> to play hockey today I'm like yeah. man we're getting smoked you touch the puck like four times like i love the yeah. enthusiasm keep it up this is what yeah. i want to be around right now yeah and uh, you know and uh there's been a lot of things that i've kind of gone back and forth in my own head and like that i've kind of you know kind of battled with because uh you know at the same time it's like how much is too much you know and so I do talk to my team and my players a lot about whether you want to admit it or not. I mean, you're very young and absolutely you should love every second of it. But at some point, there's going to be a time where you're not going to be able to play or you're not going to be able to play at the level that you want to or, or potentially, you know, have in the past. So, you know, that, that, but I also think that kind of gives them even more reason to enjoy the moment and really have fun with it and enjoy every single time that they're able to, uh, be out there and playing. And I think that's probably where Sammy kind of, you know, takes that and, and is really running with it, um, you know, because that's one of the things, you know, um, I'm super happy when I'm out there on the ice. Now now it's whether I'm coaching or playing, I have a great time and I really enjoy it. And, uh, and you know, you never know when you won't be able to get out there and skate around anymore, but hopefully, uh, hopefully it's for a long time. And so it's kind of heavy, but at the same time, I mean, that's part of life and that's, uh, it's that, and for me, you know, like I said, it, it helped to for me to enjoy it that much more every time I was out there. It, it's so refreshing to hear that, like someone actually is willing to have a hard conversation with a player, and a player totally understands it, takes it, and run with it. Like you, you just don't hear much about that, and that that's beautiful to me when I hear someone saying that. Because <laughs> I, I I remember playing for some coaches, and they just didn't want to tell you the bad news, and I'm like, just give it to me, like come on. Like, you're not, you're not helping anyone out here. Like, just tell me how it is, and we'll go on with our business. Like, there's no need to be slightly deceitful on this. So, I, right. I love that. Just open and honest, exactly what it is. Um, about, and especially parents, they appreciate that stuff more than, out, than, than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Um, the worst thing you do is lead them on and then cut them loose with some bad news. Like, that's just terrible. Right. And, and I think, you know, once you see – or once players see that you're being straightforward and honest with them, um, you know, they, they – tend to start eventually, you know, show that mutual respect. And uh, I, I, and I, honestly, one of the bigger issues that I have um, is that I think a lot of kids are used to having like an authority figure as a coach and like, well, you know, they're very hesitant to approach the coach and ask questions. 
And I try to tell them all the time, like, come up and ask questions. You know, if you have a concern about something, you shouldn't be afraid to come ask me. Um, you know, the worst thing that I can tell you is like, no, I don't want to talk about it, but you won't know un unless you ask. And I'm, and I try to, you know, make sure that parents and players understand I'm completely open and, and wanting and willing to talk about if there's any kind of issue. Because a lot of times there's so much stuff going on in a game, um, you know, even practices too, that you can't pick up or you can't see everything. And so something may happen and it, it may not seem like a big deal, but it may be a huge deal to that player, or to that family. And so you have to respect that and you have to take, take, a, take action on something and kind of nip it in the bud sooner than later because you don't want it boiling over for, you know, towards the end of the season or something like that. The, the biggest words of wisdom I forgot on this is that uh, bad news never ages well. Yeah. It, it's like it's like rotting eggs. They just get worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> just got to deal with it right away. So I, yeah. I, that's why I love Tortorella down there in CBJ. Like as soon as something bad happens, you know, there's not two days that go by before that guy's already talked about it in the group. And yeah. I think that's why they have that close bond because it's exactly what you said. Um, you're, you're building that rapport through having that honesty. And I, I think one thing for me, what you said was, letting the players come to you with issues. Like they're able to fight their own battle. That's huge with what we were talking about earlier, of helping that player become better as a person, which then is mm -hmm. going to develop them also on the ice. So, uh, Dan, I don't know if you've had any experience with that, but I think that's huge for me, especially as like a college and high school coach of those kids are starting to fight their own battles and being able to have those conversations that you're going to have as an adult. Absolutely. And, and like Jared said, you know, part of our role as coaches is to develop humans, people, and not just hockey players. And that's a huge part of it is, you know, preparing them for what real life is like, you know, after college or, or whatever. And, you know, that, that onus is on us. So yeah, making, giving them, you know, the, um, the platform to, to have the, you know, this open and honest uh, communicate line of communication is huge. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of, um, one other thing too is that uh, you know I think a lot of parents are so protective of their players, which I completely understand. Absolutely, you know, be protective and guard them, but they're they're so protective that they don't want their player to fail at anything. Right. And honestly, you know, most of my youth career, I played on teams that were you know terrible. We lost a lot, but it, that helps to build character. It helps you to learn more. You know, I'm I'm very competitive, and so even though I was on losing teams, whether we're getting blown out. You know, I wanted to uh, get better. And so now I see a lot of families that instead of like potentially their, their player could potentially get cut, they'd rather just jump ship and go to a different team and, and go over there. And I think that's unfortunate for the player because then that player gets a false sense of security um, that also translates into real life, you know. So what happens when they, they get fired from their first job or, or, you know, lose their first job? Um, you know, or get a bad grade in, in a, a high school or college course, you know, and, and, um, and they're kind of out there on their own for the first time, you know, that, that can cause other issues. So that's the one thing that I always talk about, you know, and that's what I mentioned earlier is it's okay if you fail, it's okay if you make a mistake, but, you know, just make sure that you, it's what you do after you make that mistake. You know, how are you going to react to, to that mistake? Are you just going to shut down and uh, clam up and, and, you know, just curl up in a ball on the bench? you know, or wherever, or are you going to get back out there next shift and have the best shift of your life? You know, that it's all about how you react in those scenarios. That's great. It, that reminds me of uh, PJ Fleck, row the boat. I think that's been the best one for me is like, go to the kids and be like, guys, you just got to keep your oars in the water, keep rowing. You got to have that good compass, make sure you're around good people. But otherwise you just take those oars. So I don't know. Uh, so for listeners that don't know row the boat, the whole concept around the oar is, is that the energy you bring to your life and what you're doing. Um, if you decide to take your oars out of the water and kind of just give up, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to do anything. And you're not going to be able to move on from it. But if you just keep rowing, eventually you're going to achieve what you're going to achieve or you're going to come on to something that, that's even better. So Always rowing that boat, row the boat. PJ Flex, who's now at uh, Minnesota, yeah. doing a good job there. I don't know. Do you have any mottos or anything that you kind of have? I, the two that I love are row the boat and then control the controllables. Like, just don't worry about the things that can't affect you. Just, just get better, go about your business, and do what you can do. Don't worry about anything that uh, you have no control over. Like, like the refs, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I think that's one of the biggest ones. You know, a lot of players. 
they sit there and they're they're worried about this or that or you know stuff that they they can like you said uncontrollable that you can't control that and so i i always just talk to them and i guess going back actually this is one thing i wanted to go back to is um like you said i would much prefer to not have to yell anything from the bench and just let my players play and and i i try to do that as much as possible and then once they come once they come back to the bench that's when I talk with them. That's when I coach them. And that's when I, I break down scenarios or, or even add, just ask them sometimes, hey, what did you see here? What were you trying to accomplish? Because sometimes the players saw the right play and they're trying to accomplish it. They just didn't execute properly, which happens. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we're in a rough game. We're, we're away, you know, in a different, uh, different state. And, you know, refs aren't being favorable to us. And it happens. And I go, you know, most of my career, I've been on teams for whatever reason, refs didn't like. Um, and that's something that you can't control. You know, you got to go up there, play tough. And if you know that they're calling something specifically, then do your best to try to not do that and uh, stay away from that. You know, if they're calling trips or holds or whatever. Um, and control what you can control. You, you can go out there and again, you can work as hard as you want. You can stay positive and you can uplift your teammates. And uh, those are the kind of things that we really try to focus on. And, um, oh gosh, I had another, uh, yeah. And I, I guess the other one that I kind of said earlier is, uh, you know, hard work is uh, always gonna, I forget the saying now, but uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, something like that. So oh, you nailed just, it. Yeah, <laughs> just always putting that, you know, to town there. I'm like, hey, you know, just outwork a team. I don't care if they're better than us. If we outwork them, that's going to give us the best chance to beat this team. Love that. Really appreciate you uh, coming on here, Jared. Uh, as a reward for all of our guests, we're, we're going to allow uh, two-minute plugs at the end of every episode. So if you have any things you're working on, doing, uh, want to talk about, floor is all yours for, for two minutes. Your time starts now. All right. Well, uh, one thing that you had mentioned before, you know, I, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about my hair. So, um, and actually a lot of my other friends have been talking about it, but I grew my hair out for about seven years, seven or eight years. And then um, when I moved back, I still had it for like two or three years, but um, I ended up cutting it uh, for a good cause. I donated it and um, raised money for St. Baldrick's. Uh, so for a good reason, and up until recently, I've been keeping it very, very short but I kind of decided to let it grow out. So I don't know, I may grow it out until next year. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. I don't know, is it, it might be getting a little thin up top, but- Looks um, great. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, but other than that, you know, I want to say uh, thanks to Dan and Greg for having me on. This is great. Um, you know, uh, anytime that you want to have me on again, I'd be more than happy to chat. Uh, just let me know what you want me to talk about. But um, yeah, uh, I don't know, um, you know, if you want to uh, check out the Cleveland Junior Lumberjacks uh, Travel Hockey Organization, um, you can check me out on Twitter. I think I'm just JT Labby. Uh, I don't really talk too much. I mostly like and retweet stuff that uh, Greg is talking about. And then um, for me personally, yeah, that, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then other than that, my day job, you know, I'm just. Uh, uh, insurance agent been doing that for about six years here at Keller National um, the uh, national headquarters here in Cleveland Heights uh, you know so fun stuff but um, no it's great because uh, my boss he, he's uh, he's a hockey player as well and um, he uh, used to coach with me so he's real flexible so I love that but I just want to say thanks again for having me on and uh, hope I can do it again thank you for tuning into the hockey IQ podcast we are hockey's arsenal Greg Rivak and Dan Ducart. Together, we've come together to create a platform and a community to expand on hockey intelligence, hockey IQ, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're very passionate about seeing this game played smarter and better and continue to develop itself uh, to the next level and staying on the cutting edge of things. So you can find us at Hockey's Arsenal on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're also at hockeysarsenal.com. Uh, you, from there, you can find some resources and some options to work with us. We're excited to continue this. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, follow, and share. Uh, you can also join up for our newsletter as well, where we're going to tackle anything Hockey IQ related. So we're excited to have everyone here and continue to build.